Hello everyone. On the 28th of July, journalist and author Laurie Penny shared a tweet thread critical of transphobic hate group the LGB Alliance for sharing explicitly anti-Semitic material. Laurie Penny refers to this as the intersection of anti-Semitism and transmisogyny. Now, fantasy and sci-fi author Neil Gaiman responded to this tweet by saying, not very surprising, and he's right, it isn't. You know, if the sole reason an organisation exists is to be bigoted towards one group, it isn't very surprising that they'd also be bigoted towards another group. Gaiman's comment, of course, saw dozens of angry, outraged replies from transphobes accusing him of all sorts of silly things. One of whom speculated that Gaiman's friend and co-author, the late Terry Pratchett, must have been behind the good parts of Gaiman's writing. And this set off some discussion about what Terry Pratchett would think about the trans, enormous air quotes, debate, if he were still alive today. Now I like the one user here who says Margaret Atwood's support for trans people was a shock, which seems very bizarre. Atwood's best known work is set in a dystopia where womanhood is strictly tied to the functioning of female reproductive systems. Handmaids who can't get pregnant are considered to be unwomen. You know, what were they expecting here after reading that? Maybe they thought it was a utopian novel, who knows? Anyway, on the 31st of July, Rihanna Pratchett, daughter of Terry Pratchett, weighed in by responding to the following tweet. I note that having not got over Atwood's betrayal, the GCs, GC standing for gender critical there, are trying to recruit Terry Pratchett posthumously, presumably because they know he can't contradict them. And Rihanna Pratchett says, This is horrifying. My father would most definitely not be a GC if he were still alive. Read the books. And Neil Gaiman expressed support for this tweet in another of his own. So the battle lines are drawn over what Terry Pratchett would think. On the one hand, we have his close friends and family members, and on the other, we have some random transphobes on Twitter. I wonder who's going to have the more accurate assessment of his character. There's just no way to know. And it sounds absurd, but journalist, I suppose, Sarah Dittam took this exact line of argument in an article for The Times titled, You Can't Hijack the Dead for Today's Battles. It's absurd for either trans activists or gender-critical feminists to claim that Terry Pratchett would have supported them. Sarah Dittam is one of the 600,000 identical opinion piece authors whose sole job is to fill British newspapers with what has become Britain's principal cultural export, miserable complaining about trans people. So, Dittam relays the argument, including Rihanna Pratchett's statement on the issue, which should be the end of it, really, before going on to say, but some other people probably think Pratchett might have been a transphobe, so who knows, there's just no way to know. Now, my favourite part of this article is the following passage. It makes as much sense to speculate about which side he'd have chosen as it does to ask what P.G. Woodhouse would have thought about lockdown or how Jane Austen would have taken the decolonization of the National Trust. The dead cannot be measured by the standards of a world in which they never lived. Now, this is a particularly weird comparison, isn't it? Woodhouse died in 1975, and Jane Austen died in 1817, whereas Terry Pratchett died six years ago. Unless Ditham is claiming that trans people only became a thing within the last couple of years, this insisting that Pratchett couldn't have possibly had any opinions on trans issues is truly bizarre. Now, if the gender-critical crowd had anything at all here, anything to go on that suggests that Pratchett would have been on their side, they would be on the attack right now. They're not usually known for their timidity in such matters. Sarah Dittam's both sides are wrong position is actually a hasty retreat. It's a signal to please stop pushing the Terry Pratchett thing because it's a losing battle for us. The transphobes accidentally opened up a losing front. Pratchett was an immensely popular author. Lots of famous people knew him personally. There's stories being posted about his support for trans people. His family and colleagues are stating he was not a transphobe and there's been a surge of interest in the trans themes in his novels. 
So now Sarah Ditton is hastily like, oh no, less of that, please. Terry Pratchett's been dead for like 200 years or something, right? Let's stop with all this wild speculation. Now, I confess I am not actually all that interested in the non-debate over what Terry Pratchett would think if he were alive. Firstly, because obviously people who knew him and worked with him are going to have much more insight into what he would think than some random bigots on Twitter. Uh, But mainly, I'm not all that interested because Terry Pratchett was a prolific author who wrote thousands upon thousands of words in dozens of books. So if we want to know his opinions about something, we could just take his daughter's advice and read the books. Now, if someone were to ask me if I were a big fan of Discworld, I would answer that I'm six foot two and around 260 pounds, because that's my joke I do when people ask me if I'm a big fan of something. Uh, But yes, I've read almost all the Discworld books, some multiple times, I like them a lot, and if you've never read them, I would enthusiastically recommend you check them out. Anyway, as a self-professed Discworld expert here, please allow me to waffle about it for a bit. So, something you see come up again and again in the Discworld series are characters who are supposed to act one way, whether that's to conform with social, political, or religious norms, or even to conform to the sort of role someone like them is expected to play in a story, uh, finding themselves wanting to act another way, and being true to themselves despite the role they're expected to play. And this goes all the way to the series' roots. Uh, The third book in the series, Equal Rights, Hardy Heart, is about the Discworld's first female wizard. You know, girls are supposed to be witches, of course, and boys are supposed to be wizards, but this girl is a wizard, and what does that mean? The Witches series of books is frequently concerned with the role that witches are supposed to play in stories, and how the characters conform to or defy those archetypes is often a large part of the narrative. And we see the same process on a larger scale for the Discworld's social groups. The principal setting of the books, the city of ankh Morpork, is a melting pot of the world's various races and cultures, all of which have stereotypes for and expectations of the other groups. Speciesism is the disc's analogue for our racism, and is most often explored in the City Watch books, where self-professed speciesist Sam Vimes has to oversee adding dwarves, werewolves, vampires, trolls, and so on to the ranks of the City Watch. And how all these different groups, with their histories of killing and oppressing and often eating each other, learn to live alongside one another is an ongoing theme. Also important is how these groups think of themselves, how they expect members of their own group to act, and how that interacts with their cultures and identities being absorbed into the dominant culture of the big city. So, with all that in mind, uh, the Discworld dwarves. Now, much of the discussion about Pratchett's opinion of trans people is focused on his dwarf characters, and specifically a dwarf from the Watch series, Corporal Littlebottom, which is a wonderful name. So Discworld's dwarves, poking a bit of fun at Tolkien's dwarves, uh, typically all present as men, with what sex a dwarf actually is being considered a private affair, sort of a don't-ask, don't-tell system except with regard to sex rather than sexuality. Anyway, Corporal Littlebottom decides to live openly as a woman, coming out as being a woman, basically, which obviously is not hard at all to read as an analogy for the experiences of trans people in our world. Now, as with many other of Pratchett's characters who break with traditions, it is to some degree played for laughs, right? Corporal Littlebottom retains her beard, and the heels on her boots are made of iron, for instance, Uh, but the humour is not presented in a way that is cruel or unaccommodating to the character herself. She is never presented as having done anything wrong, merely unexpected, and the humour comes from the subversion of that expectation, basically. It isn't malicious. Pratchett finds humour in all manner of topics considered sensitive race, sex, gender, and so on, the sorts of things that unfunny stand-up comedians bemoan you can't joke about anymore. And he's able to do so firstly because he doesn't punch down, but also because he doesn't just use issues like that for laughs, he treats them as seriously as their real-world counterparts. 
Dwarves who live openly as women in the Discworld are subject to discrimination. There are slurs for them. There are religious fundamentalist underground dwarven groups who think the surface-dwelling dwarves have been corrupted by modern society and so on. And the novel The Fifth Elephant features the possibility of a civil war between traditionalist and progressive dwarf groups. So we have a social expectation for certain people, or dwarves in this case, to act like their society's idea of a certain gender, and we have social repercussions for individuals who go against those expectations. And Pratchett's sympathies are pretty obviously with the progressives over the bigoted traditionalists. In response to one of Neil Gaiman's tweets supporting Rihanna Pratchett, someone responded with the following post. Since you're also of an age to remember, you will know that Pratchett had no views on transgenderism because it just wasn't a thing on anyone's radar. Your disingenuous implication that many of his books have trans themes or allegories is just mob pandering, queer washing history. And Gaiman responded that in 2010 or so, Pratchett told him that he was proud that trans people saw themselves in his dwarves. Now, it just wasn't a thing on anyone's radar is reminiscent of Sarah Dittam's claim that the dead cannot be measured by the standards of a world in which they never lived. You know, they're trying to make it seem as if trans people just popped into existence in the last couple of years here. Now, I take issue with this, of course, not just because to read Pratchett's Dwarves as being in no way a commentary on trans issues requires a significant mental stretch, and not just because people insisting to Pratchett's daughter and co-author that they know more about what the man's opinions would be than they do is ridiculous, but because nobody's talking about Monstrous Regiment. Now, Monstrous Regiment is another Discworld novel by Pratchett that contains an even more obvious trans... well, not analogy, really, just straight up what we would consider a trans character. So, spoilers for Monstrous Regiment here, obviously. It's a good book, like most of the Discworld novels, and I'd recommend reading it, and if you want to read it unspoiled, goodbye, basically, because from here on out I'll be talking about the whole plot. So, Monstrous Regiment starts out as a Mulan-like story, in which a young woman, Polly Perks, disguises herself as a man and enters military service during wartime in order to track down her brother, who's missing in action. Polly's country, Borogravia, is deeply conservative and considers things like women joining the army or dressing in men's clothes to be abominations unto their god. So, Polly blasphemously enlists in the military and is placed in a regiment of supposedly male soldiers who, over the course of the novel, are revealed one by one to also be women who join the military disguised as men, all of whom with their own individual reason for doing so. A whole regiment of Mulans, basically. One of them is pregnant and searching for the father. Uh, when one of the pair of particularly close recruits is discovered by Polly to be a woman, she assumes she joined the military to follow her man, except the man in question is also later revealed to be a woman. And this confuses Polly, who is chided for her sheltered lack of imagination by the regiment's vampire recruit, Maledict, who of course is later revealed to be Maledicta. They're all women is the joke, and it's a good joke, it's funny. And of course they go on to have an adventure and bring an end to the war and all that. Uh, but that's not that important for us today. What I want to focus on is pronouns. Because how Pratchett uses pronouns here is important, obviously, given the nature of the story. And when gendering the characters, the narrative follows the perspective of Polly. So when Polly thinks a character is a man, the narration refers to them as he, him. But as Polly discovers they are in disguise, the narration changes to refer to them as she, her. So it's Polly's understanding that is guiding the narrator and the reader in how characters should be gendered. So with that in mind, uh, the leader of the regiment is an old experienced soldier named Sergeant Jackram. And at the conclusion of the story, Polly suspects that he too joined the military as a woman and has spent decades living as a man, and asks him about it. Now, at the start of the conversation, Jackram is still referred to as he. He stared into his beer, he unfastened the locket, and so on. As he tells his story to Polly, however, a story of him following his lover to war, 
Jack Rim follows the pattern of the other characters and becomes a she in the narration. She began very carefully to transfer the chewing tobacco. Uh, this happens even though Jack Rim himself still refers to himself as a man in his speech. I'm my own man, always have been, he says. So Polly and Jackram discuss what Jackram is going to do now that the war is over. Jackram has a son he's never met, but expresses discomfort and embarrassment at the idea of turning up as his mother, to which Polly says, What about a distinguished sergeant major, shiny with braid, loaded with medals, arriving at the front door in a grand coach and telling him he's his father? Now with the end of the war and Jackram retiring from the army, there's no legal reason that he would need to pretend to be a man anymore. Continuing to live as a man would be for no other reason than because he wants to do it, because that's how he is more comfortable being perceived. And as Jackram is considering this idea, an interesting thing happens. Jackram's pronouns in the narration change back. Polly paused when she got to the door. Jackram had turned her chair to the fire and had settled back. Around him, the kitchen worked. Now, in pitching the idea to keep living as a man, Polly frames it for Jackram as a bit of cheeky deception. You know, the act of a trickster merely deciding to keep the act up. Now, whether she actually believes this, or whether she thinks it's just the best way to get Jackram to consider what she's saying, is up to the reader here but the narration knows the truth. Jackram isn't a woman pretending to be a man at this point. He's just a man. In the epilogue of the story, Polly receives a message from Jackram with a photograph of him as a man united with his son's family, which is nice, and Polly becomes a sergeant in the reformed military that now admits women. And the novel ends with her meeting a pair of prospective army recruits, who are, of course, women disguised as men, and Polly tells the recruits that they're free to join as men if they like, saying it's up to them. And that's how Monstrous Regiment ends. The conclusion of the story is a positive affirmation of self-identification, and this novel was first published in 2003. The idea that Terry Pratchett lived in a world where trans issues were not a thing on anyone's radar is clearly not true. <laughs> I mean... Obviously, but you know, there you go. I, I proved it anyway. Uh, thanks a lot for watching, folks. And thank you especially to my supporters over on Patreon, some of whom should be scrolling by right now. Patreon backers get early access to all my videos when they're worse and bits are missing and they've got mistakes in them. If you'd also like to ruin your viewing experience, I'll leave a link to my Patreon below. Alright, that's it for me today, folks. I'll see you next time.